Japan by River Cruise is made possible thanks to those who donate to the show at JapanByRiverCruise.com and due to the generosity of my corporate sponsors. This week's sponsor is the Fit for the Office training program, Yareba Dekimasuru. The second state of emergency has come to an end, which means the pandemic is over and we can all go back to normal. In fact, we have to go back to normal, or else we can't have the Olympics. So you and the rest of the country are going to have to start acting like it's Japanese business as usual once more. But is your body ready for business as usual? Have you been getting by with half ass Zoom bows that don't engage your core? Have you gotten used to the comfort of your own home washlet and don't know if you still have the hamstring strength for your office's squat toilet? Are you planning on taking the stairs instead of getting in an elevator with your co-workers because Corona could still kill you? Then let us help you with our high intensity total body workouts designed to help you get back into the peak physical fitness that salaried Japanese workers are known for. Courses can be completed totally in the discomfort of your own home, as they consist entirely of picking up and putting down two litre bottles of shochu, which you should already have. Buy today and get started on your fitness journey. Or just get the dopamine rush you crave by buying the course and don't. Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Ollie Horn. And our guest this week is business consultant and author Rochelle Kopp, joining us for her fifth trip down the JBRC River, which means you've officially completed your first punch card. Congratulations, Rochelle! Thank you. What do I get from my punch card? Your next appearance will be free, by which I mean unpaid. Great. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you. On this week's show, we'll catch up with Rochelle about all things Tokyo Olympics with a focus on how Japan seems intent on running the games like they were a Japanese business, which is to say much, much worse than they did in the 70s. Plus, Ollie's got your weekly river cruise recommendation. Ollie? Yes, Bobby. You've heard of a cat cafe, right? Yes. And you know what an owl cafe is? Mm-hmm. And you're familiar with a hedgehog cafe. Yeah, it'd be like an owl cafe. But Bobby, I'm going to stop you there because this week's recommendation is the Noah's Ark Experience River Cruise in Odaiba. Oh, like a, like a, a riverborne petting zoo. Yeah, sort of. But the passengers take the role of Noah himself and are given a net, some cable ties and some tranquilizer dance. Also, later in the show, some regrettable business on my end. As Japan's official International River Cruise Ambassador, I'm going to talk about the reasons behind my controversial decision to withdraw from the Olympic torch relay. Uh, if the IOC is listening, I am sorry, but my mind is made up, so don't worry about responding to that letter I wrote you four years ago asking to be considered. But first, Soap Talk. <laughs> Brian, you recently tweeted, I wonder how much cat hair I unknowingly ingest on a daily basis. Can you tell us what that was all about? I would rather not. Brian, do you have cats? Yeah, I guess. Rochelle, speaking of cats, yesterday I read the news that a whole lane of highway in Fukuoka was shut down because of one stray cat. Do you miss Fukuoka yet? Uh, yes, very much. <laughs> Three-hour traffic jam for, for a cat on the divider. It's so sweet, isn't it? Bobby, do you remember how heroic you were when there was a cat stuck on the roof next door to my apartment in, in Tenjin? Yeah, didn't I go over a balcony and jump off of a roof? You had to. You, you did more than go over a balcony. You did parkour. You, you basically jumped from one building to another to rescue this cat. Yeah. And the reason that you did so, right, was I heard this screaming for about two days and I thought that something's up. I discovered it was a cat. Didn't know what to do. Called the police. And they said, we will come and take a look. But if there isn't a cat there, and if you've caused us bother, please know that you may be charged for wasting police time. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So then what we decided to do was to just have me go over there. And then Ollie called the police and was like, there's a weird foreigner on the roof. And they came right away. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm definitely not wasting your time now. <laughs> No, but but the lady on the phone was was really like concerned for me. She said, "Look, I know that I I know that you're being kind to this cat." She was kind of speaking quite simply, right? I know you're being kind to this cat, but are you sure you want to bring the police? And I said, "Well, what else should I do? Fire? You know, like who do I call a vet?" Uh, and so yeah, so basically the police advised me, "Hey, we're trouble." Um, or, or maybe the people that I'm going to dispatch might be trouble. 
Uh, and so yeah, Bobby. And then you 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 did you. And then the roof we discovered was like a tin roof, which you could yeah. have fallen through. Yeah, so, so I had to like him. walk around and try to find places that were stable, that had like yeah. some sort of load bearing support underneath them. Was it in the summertime? I feel like it was. And was it a cat on a hot tin roof? Oh, hey. <laughs> that's why we bring her back so many times. <laughs> You may not be a regular listener to the show. I mean, it'd be hard enough for you to just find time to listen to all the episodes you were on. But um, regular listeners will know that I am now a cat person. I I adopted a cat. uh, Or rather, a cat turned up at my house long enough, uh, shat in my bed once, and I created some kind of emotional connection on that basis, I think. And uh, now I've I've gone through the (laughs) gradual expense of, uh, of getting her vaccinated. Today was her rabies jab. Um, like she, she's now more like resilient than I am, and also better documented. She's got this cute passport, uh, and every time she gets a jab, something, something else goes in it. She has a she has a greater right to stay in this country than I do. But something which um which I thought you might be interested, Rochelle, in your cross cultural consultancy practice is, I see this cat as British. By that I mean this cat was born in Malaysia. It's a Malaysian cat, or actually its ancestry is probably Persian because it's got Persian hair. But when I when I imagine that cat's internal narrative, I think the cat's from the United Kingdom. Why? Well, because every cat I knew growing up was, was a British cat, right? I know this sounds absolutely absurd, but bear with me. But like, just in my mind, I can't imagine it's it, it's. I can't imagine my cat's internal narrative is Malay, but I can imagine its its internal narrative is British English. Is the are there? Any... I, I never imagined a cat's internal narrative. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. For me, it's it's interesting because I have considered the idea of the effects of culture on pets because I've never seen Japanese dogs behave the way American dogs behave. I've never seen a Japanese dog chase a cat. I, and I, I've noticed that like 90% of Japanese dogs are uninterested in people who are not their owners, whereas American dogs are interested in everyone. Is, that, is this just me being crazy? Am I am I just that, like imagining the voice of a cat in my head here, or is this something other people have <laughs> have noticed? Does it have anything to do with the breeds that are prevalent in Japan? Could be. Uh, yes, the owners are mostly Japanese bred. <laughs> oh, did you mean you meant the oh? <laughs> the dogs. I wonder whether it's to do with how social people people are when they're walking dogs, because. I get the impression yeah. from American movies that it's a thing, right? That's how you're supposed to meet your wife. You're both walking a dog. And maybe Americans are more open to just chatting to strangers about their pets. Is that an explanation? Well, I definitely think that that's one thing that goes on, yes. Yeah, I, I do wonder how much of like the owner's personality and the owner's culture gets reflected in the pet's behavior. Because, like, like I said, I mean, Japanese dogs are just so chill and so focused solely on the owners. And I feel like I've seen it across breeds. I feel like you don't see a Japanese person walking like a golden retriever and the golden retriever is going to come up and slobber, slobber on you like it would in America. Yeah. I mean, it could be just how they train them. They train them not to do that. If they, if they do it naturally, they've been told not to. Hmm. And I also think just like their owners, I've noticed a lot of Japanese dogs have uh, difficulty expressing themselves in a different language. I've never seen a Japanese dog meow. Good point. You can at least <laughs> laugh. For, for the sake of an audio podcast, I'm obviously making I'm making an attempt to make jokes. Rochelle, do a laugh and we'll edit it in. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Good. Well, that, that, that's, arguably, that's worse. Hey, speaking of Ollie not being funny, somebody bought us a coffee this week. Well, th- this is why I'm actually, this is why I'm trying to be so funny this week, and it's not working, is it? It's obviously obviously having the opposite effect. Uh, I don't know what it is about people that are, 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 you know, they give with one hand and take with another. We're very grateful to everyone that supports this show financially. Uh, but te- or technically, in any other way. they're just using both hands to give to me. This was a very complimentary <laughs> message Basically, to me. Basically, SGC Delta Man Delta bought Man. us three coffees with the comment. So that that's great. Thanks for that. Genuinely. Thank you. With the comment. Sorry, you're not as funny, Ollie. So one for Ollie and two for Bobby. Yeah, it's so weird that is, the name is... is Delta Man because this was a total, total alpha male move. Exactly. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for uh, sending the uh, coffees. And uh, to the extent to which uh, I'm going to balance my principles of wanting to have dignity and wanting to have money, I am happy for you to say anything, uh, <laughs> positive or negative, providing it's accompanied with paypal money so uh yeah buymeacoffee.com forward slash japan by river cruise bobby i'm gonna try my best to be funny 
in the news. Shall we jump to <clears throat> the news? The Nikkei Asia reports Japan's Kirin Brewery hopes Home Dispenser will help it sell more beer. Their first ad campaign will be aimed at Japan's housewives with a simple but direct message. If you buy your husband a home beer dispenser, maybe you can stop being one. Our own JBRC Press Club has followed up on the story. Yes, correspondent at Olaf Hellman talks about similar home appliance plans by Kirin's competitors, including the Asahi Super Dry Ofuro and the Sapporo Spout Bidet. And reporter at Paul Nadeau was supposed to file, but instead resigned because, and I quote, we have finally achieved the technology to ensure that I never have to see any of you people ever again. Rochelle, there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to cut to the chase. Should someone have put a stop to the Olympics by now? Well, I really wish that someone had, but it doesn't seem like it would have been really possible. Mm. Because it's not something that one person could do. Yeah. Um, well, we talked with Atsuro Tsujino, who's a lawyer, about the contract between the host city and the International Olympic Committee, which basically leaves Tokyo completely liable for any you know, losses incurred by the IOC by not holding the Olympics, which we, we assumed was the main reason for it not going through. But there's a lot to talk about over the decisions and the indecisions around the Olympics happening this summer. Oh, yeah, that Tokyo Olympic contract just left Tokyo so exposed. It was like someone wearing a mask, but, you know, not covering their nose. Take that, SGC Delta man. <laughs> well, what a, what a, what a gag. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, I, I guess the point is that even if Tokyo could get out of the contract, if it wasn't over a barrel, there seems to be lots of reasons why we've reached a point of no return where the Olympics are just going to happen in some form or maybe happen in name only. And yeah. I've said for ages on this podcast, and I ha still expect to be right, the Olympics won't happen, right? Like, there won't be an Olympics as we know it, but there might be something which is called the Olympics and quacks like the Olympics and costs as much money as the Olympics, but, <laughs> but isn't the Olympics. Well, they're, and they're we already wanna... moving in that direction by not allowing the foreign spectators in, right? Well, that's the first big story, isn't it? C can there be an Olympics with only domestic spectators? But all, but all the IOC cares about is the TV. And TV's just fine. It doesn't matter who's in the stands. Hmm. Is that the case, Rochelle? Do you think that that's really what's driving this? That the real money owner is the, yeah. the syndication rights? The real money is the TV money. And the, 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 the in-person tickets are gravy, but I, I think those pretty much go to the host country. I don't think the Olympic um, Committee gets as much of that. In any ways, the amount of money is much smaller. Are they refunding tickets for people who aren't going to be able to attend now? Yes, they are. And it's a whole mess because they, they everyone overseas had to buy through certain registered agents. Mm -hmm. And each one has different rules and it takes a long time. So it's not pretty, actually. Yeah, I think I remember saying it was going to cost Japan an additional so much billion yen to go through the refund process not counting the money that they lose. I wouldn't by be surprised. It. I wouldn't be surprised. It's really, yeah, it's really, well, one, you just have to move money, but it's also, you have to have staff to handle it. It's not easy. So to deal with that point that Ali raised about this idea that, you know, without foreign spectators, you're moving away from the image of a traditional Olympics. What will they be doing in the absence of foreign spectators? Well, you know, they have said that the Japanese spectators are going to cheer for everybody. Hmm. <clears throat> And I've just been imagining what that's going to look like because you know that there's going to be some like really genki middle-aged Japanese guy who makes it his life mission to make sure that every team gets cheered for. Right. And I can just see like assignments like you guys, you're you're tr cheering for Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> well. and you're cheer cheer cheering for Chile and you're cheering for Romania and they're going to have assignments. This guy's going to have a spreadsheet and a clipboard. I'm just imagining this person. I don't think you, you know even, this person, don't you? I don't think you even need that guy because Every every non-Japanese person living in Japan has come across a Japanese person at some point in their career here that is really into a specific country or a specific sport to an insane level. Like I met right. a Japanese salary man who was like 54 coming up on retirement and was really into American Division Three high school football or something like that. And there's somebody out there that already has like a Lithuanian 
badminton poster on his wall that he's going, yeah. this is my moment. Or, or, the, or the, you know, the New Zealand luge team. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Suddenly the guy who's just, who's just had loads of Montenegro flags is all of a sudden like, oh my God, I thought this day would never happen. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, there's definitely all those people and they will be coming out. In droves, yeah. right? So the Olympics were supposed to help the economy through tourism. If there are going to be spectators, it's, it's going to be people that were already there. So if all the money that was going to be recouped through tourism is not being made, who's footing the bill? Taxpayers. Hmm. Japanese taxpayers. And specifically, not just Tokyo taxpayers, right? Nationally too. It's the whole country. I mean, there. I think I have the sense that probably Tokyo taxpayers will have more of a burden, but there's also it's national too as well. And what's your reading of how people feel about that? Because I remember when the Olympics was announced uh, way, well, it seems like years ago now. I guess it seems like years ago because it was years ago. The, uh, the, re- the reaction was, we don't like the idea that Tokyo is going to get all the benefit from this. Why can't the Olympics be more nationally distributed in Kyushu? We're going to be... Uh, you know, p- part of the expenditure, but not necessarily get much of the benefits. Tourists aren't going to travel all the way down here. We're getting a raw deal. Now, when it seems like the Olympics aren't going to make money, but lose money, <laughs> maybe people like Kyushu are looking to separate themselves and go, yeah, that's your own mess. Go sort that out yourself. But but what's your what's your reading of the, the average voter and, and whether they are kind of, whether they're caring about this, whether they see that it's their money that's being uh, spunked up the wall? Mm, well, I think, you know, as with anything else, there's people who are paying attention and think about these things and people who don't, mm-hmm. right? And so for the people who are paying attention, they're well aware that it's ballooning costs and it's all coming out of their pockets. And I think a lot of people are not happy about it. I think this is one of those things where the more information that comes out, you're not convincing anyone new. It's it's just kind of further splitting the two sides. And as Rochelle said, you know, people who all already were paying attention felt one way about it. But the people who were already paying attention weren't weren't just concerned with, you know, the Olympics not necessarily uh, benefiting the whole country. They were already aware that the idea that the Olympics benefits uh, a country's economy is already kind of a faulty idea. And they were also concerned about things like, okay, you're putting all this money into building an Olympic stadium. Um, could we finish rebuilding the infrastructure in Tohoku before we do that. I mean, there those people are already concerned with other things. Yes. Right. And and there is that kind of with any public policy, right? There's always the what aboutism. You know, with anything, right? You know, we're we're going to be giving money to nurses. Oh, well, why aren't you giving it to police officers or you know, th- those people all, always exist. But I think the reason why this really uh this really grates is there are so many people that think that the Olympics happening is bad optics because it shows that these policy decisions are being made with a complete one-track mind and with no consideration of any collateral damage. I mean, one example which I saw you tweeting about a lot, Rochelle, was the fact that Olympians are now being allowed into the country. However, people who might have other reasons to come into the country, such as the fact that they want to work in Japan or study in Japan, or let's not forget the people who have loved ones that aren't married, so they can't come over for those kind of reasons... They're still not. There's enough. even like married people who can't reunite as well. There's true, married still? people who are stuck apart also. Goodness me. Yeah. So, you know, th- th- there's there's this terrible optics that they're letting people in, but in some people's view, it's the wrong people. Yeah. No. And and th- th- those people who have been waiting to get into Japan are really, really not happy, and and because their lives are are basically on hold, and a lot of them are younger people starting um, graduate programs or starting undergraduate programs or starting their careers. Um, you know, all the jet people, for example, they can't come over. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're in your twenties, you know, uh, putting your life on hold for a year has a really big impact yeah. Yeah. on, on everything for you. Right. And so for, for all these people who've been waiting, it feels like a slap in the face. That, oh, yeah, we're going to let the athletes and their entourages in. Mm. If only they'd spent that year getting good at an Olympic sport. Yeah. Um, so so optically, it's bad in that sense. Last week, we touched on how optically the Tokyo 2020 Olympics have just been a disaster all over. You know, when we talked about the Olympic incident, when we talked about uh, Mori, this has just been a, a way for Japan to continue to show its ass on a global stage over and over again. And I'm kind of reminded of 
you know, however many years ago when it was announced that Tokyo was going to host the Olympics and how it started this whole boom about, look, the eyes of the world are on Japan and look how highly regarded we are in the eyes of the world, which led to this huge explosion in entertainment content about how great the world thought Japan was. And now we're like, we're a year past when the Olympics was supposed to be held and coming up on them holding it a year late and the eyes of the world are on Japan and Japan has just been failing on the global stage over and over and over again. I'm kind of wondering, is this going to spawn like an explosion of content about how what the world thinks doesn't really matter? <laughs> Why we don't care. <laughs> But Rochelle, do you think that this shows something about the way in which decision making is done in Japan? I mean, you, most of your work is about explaining to American companies how Japanese companies think and, and vice versa. And while it, obviously it doesn't need to be said that the coronavirus happening wasn't Japan's fault and couldn't really have been foreseen. Obviously, pandemics probably did appear on the bottom page of some risk assessment document at some point. But Really, people are upset about the response to the pandemic. No one's blaming Japan for having to have postponed the Olympics, but they're blaming the fact that it was postponed too late. They're blaming the fact that they're doing this weird watered down version. They're blaming the fact that they're not trying using this to try something innovative, where lo loads of other industries have uh, used this opportunity to try remote events for the first time or you know whatever it is. And a lot of people seem to think that this is like, that there's a certain kind of inertia that's been created about all the decisions which have already been made, which means that it's the original plan or at best a slightly watered down version of the original plan. Is there anything in the way that Japanese organizations make decisions that can explain why at every single juncture decisions have been made too late and arguably in a pretty uninspiring and regretful way. Well, generally for Japanese organizations, once a decision has been made or an organization is on a certain course, it's very, very difficult to change that. In other words, there's not really a, a chance for course correction. And so Japanese organizations and how they do things works really well in a stable and predictable environment. When, like, you're planning to make a car or something like that, it works really well. You plan it and then you do it, right? Um, but Japanese decision making doesn't work so well in dynamically changing environments or when there are unanticipated things that come up. And so that's been this situation, right? There's not a lot of flexibility in response. So when you talk about Japanese decision making, what do you compare that to? What's another model of decision making that could have been used? The one I always contrast with is the U.S. style of decision making. And again, it's not that one is better or worse. It, you know, we don't want to be judgmental, but some work better in different circumstances than others, right? So, for example, American decision making is really not so great at making cars or other things that need high quality. American decision making is really good when things are changing really quickly and you have to be flexible and adapt. So basically, yeah. in American decision making... You start off, you know you need to make a decision, you do some data gathering and analysis, but that's limited because you know you can't predict the future because your assumption is that the environment is ever-changing and thus unknowable. Yeah. So you just it's hit a direction and then you start doing stuff and then you see how it works. And then whatever doesn't work, you change mm. and then you adjust and you do iterations and then it takes time to implement, but then you're able to implement it. And during that implementation period, if circumstances change, you can change quickly too. Yeah. I understand that one Japanese principle is the idea of Kaizen, of continuous improvement, which seems to be an iterative process too. Is the distinction then just the length of time that it takes to go from one iteration to another? Ah, uh, you know, what I would say is kind of a different type of iteration. That typically the American iteration will be like really fundamentally changing the nature of what you're doing from each iteration. You could make really huge changes, right? right? And it's nothing set in stone. Basically, what Japanese will do is they'll do a whole process with lots of analysis and information gathering and planning and consensus building and nemawashi, and that takes a really, really long time. Then they'll make a decision. And then at that point, it's set in stone. Mm. 
But then when there is continuous improvement that happens, it's on top of what was already decided. Right. And it happens later after you execute. So in the case of, of the Olympics, you would do the whole thing as planned, and then you would look and see, okay, what went well or didn't go well. And then assuming you were going to do another Olympics the next year, then you'd you know, make tweaks yeah. then. So yeah. you're kind of, it's a really big cycle rather than like the little ones that would be more dynamic. So have we hit the point where the inertia that's behind the Tokyo Olympics, it seems like, and we've seen a lot of people saying that we've come this far, they're going to go ahead no matter what. I mean, it seems like last week they realized that they actually had to play on the opening ceremony and had a huge cluster that happened around that one. Um, and then they've actually started running the uh, torch relay. Right. And there was someone from the Japanese government today who was quoted in the Asahi who said, now that the torch relay has begun, we can no longer stop. So yeah, they're telling you exactly, we have hit that point of no return. The battleship is on the move and it can't be steered in yeah. any other direction or stopped. This was the Tokyo Olympics kind of crossing the Rubicon moment, um, which by the way, right. Rubicon's got a fantastic river cruise. Uh, but that idea of... Uh, the Olympic torch relay has been started, and so we can't stop. I, when I saw that, my first thought was like, is this that legendary Olympic Greek mythology where it's like the fire can't go out? Once you've got the torch burning, you've got to keep the Olympic flame. And, and then when I looked into that exact same article, it mentioned that uh, the Greek leg of the Olympic torch relay was canceled. Like, <laughs> it's not about tradition. It's not about preserving the flame. Like, the Greeks didn't do theirs. Because of the coronavirus. Uh, or laziness. I'm not oh. sure. It didn't specify. <laughs> <laughs> but th this does seem like a classic case of externalization. The, the kind of the, the shogunai, oh, it can't be helped, is, 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 is a response, which I'm sure anyone who's lived in Japan for any period of time, when they experience their first shogunai, they... they they want to respond, no, shogun aru, there's a way. Like, just take responsibility, right? Right, right. Oh, no, that was like my first three, two years in Japan. I was doing that every day. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and this idea of, well, the torch the torch has already started moving, so I guess that's it now, seems to just be a deflection. But the, the, the problem seems to be that no one knows who it's a deflection from. Who is the person or people that need to put their head above the parapet and say, Okay, guys, just because that torch has been passed around doesn't mean that we need to kill people. It's actors and actresses who are doing that. There are uh, all sorts of actors and actresses who are pulling out of their roles as celebrity torch relay runners. And they're doing it in such a Japanese way because uh, having been in agencies, I've had this experience where all of them have their managers going, I'm sorry, they have a scheduling conflict. <laughs> like, <laughs> This once yeah, in a it's lifetime such a, it's honor. Such a, it's such a totally lame excuse, isn't right. it? Right. What, what was the conflict? For oh, no well, you you booked them in the middle of a pandemic, and yeah. that somewhat got in the way. So, right. I mean, you know, obviously these people had it on their schedule for like the last two years or whatever. Exactly. You know, it's not like they suddenly had a conflict that they didn't expect, right? It's so transparent. Well, there's some that we should give credit to. There's a comedian, uh, Tamara Atsushi, who made it clear that his decision to pull out was because of Maury's remarks. Uh, it's a protest over mm. the sexist remarks. And it also looks like um, Tokiwa Takako. Uh, that was also the real reason for her to pull out as well. Uh, no, no, she said, uh, uh, <laughs> she actually went out of her way to clarify that it was because of scheduling and not to do with the series of problems. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure everyone knows I'm not doing this because of systematic sexism. <laughs> I'm doing it because I had a hair appointment at four. Keep it up. You're, you're doing fine. <laughs> so, Rochelle, is there, is there any way in which something extraordinary is going to happen now? Is there anything built into the way that, that the Olympics is being organized that means that we're going to get some shock headline that, that they've seen sense and just called it off boy i'm really having trouble imagining it i'm just looking at a japanese gambaru 
even if it means just like half the you know even if like half the athletes don't come yeah. and, or this or that or problem they'll like do something but as you said earlier it might just be a shadow of a normal olympics yeah but i just feel like they're just going to gumbadu at this point no matter what you know i do still think that there's a way that japan could turn this into a domestic pr win right because if you remember three years ago, the conversation was all about how Japan was not doing a good job of getting ready for this. People were saying, you know, they're never going to have the stadium done in time. And, and Tokyo doesn't have the capacity to accommodate all of these incoming visitors. And those have essentially become non-issues. <laughs> yeah, it's like, do we build the stadium by 2020? Expand the transport infrastructure? Build more hotels? No. Let's just mismanage a health crisis. And then we'll see who looks like they're doing a bad job. <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for listening to this Japan by River Cruise, episode 77. If you've enjoyed the show, then every single month we send out a roundup of all of our episodes, plus some other bonus content. And if you'd like it, go to japanbyrivercruise.com, enter in your email address, and allow us to spam you once a month. That email's going out in a few days. We'd be glad for you to receive it. And thank you very much to our guest this week, series regular Rochelle Kopp. Rochelle, if anybody would like to follow you, uh, which countries will you be cheering for at the Olympics? Oh, um, well, I was thinking more what sports, like the ultimate Frisbee. Didn't they just make that an Olympic sport? So I want to go check that out. <laughs> well, well, I've heard that they, they've now closed the Olympic gift shop. So maybe you'll be able to buy a Tokyo 2020 Olympic branded Frisbee for, for half off if you're lucky. There you go. Perfect. Thanks for listening. Join us back here next week for more consumer advice from Ollie.